We've been doing a series called God's Word, and this is the third part in that series. Let's stand together as we look at the book of Romans. Romans, God's Word, we're going to be reading about it and talking about it. Looking at Romans, the 10th chapter, and I'd like to start with verse 8. A couple of words into verse 8, actually. It says, the Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then then shall they call upon in him who they have not believed, and how they shall believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who are bringing glad tidings of good things. However, they did not heed the glad tidings. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Finally, verse 17, which is my life verse. It says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You may be seated. King James says of God, New American Standard says of Christ. Christ is God. We've been going through 40, I did say 40, things the word of God does and is. Now that just scratches the surface, but we want to at least begin by 40. Today, we're looking at number 22. The word of God is burden. It says in Zechariah, the ninth chapter, by the way, the prophet Zechariah is huge in his strength and power and word. But here's what he says in Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Zechariah says, the burden of the word of the Lord. With God's word comes a burden. And it's a great burden. It's a great responsibility. It's a call to action. God's word is never neutral, right? It's not a, ah, take it or leave it, right? It's, it's not a take it or leave it deal. It's never neutral. It comes with power, and it comes with conviction, and it comes with responsibility, and it comes, as this scripture says, comes with burden. Our daughter, Christina, when she was a little one, you might have heard me tell the story before, I don't know, but anyway, when she was little, she was just barely toddling, maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe 13, 14 months, but she was just a little thing. And we had moved into this new little house. I do mean little house. <laughs> and the rent was a huge savings for us, right? Because the rent was $127. That saved us $3 a month. And that was a very big deal for us to not have to pay 130 but to move. We did a whole move, moved our stuff over for $3. So we get a rental for $127. And, and this was exciting, but there was one problem with this little house. It had this grate on the floor, and it was, of course, air flowing hot, and so 
It would come up from the floor and that grate would get hot. I mean, hot, hot. It would get red hot sometimes. It had been going for a while. This was great. And so we went to our little girl, Christina, and we pointed at the grate and said, hot, you know, and she would go, hot, you know, and, and we'd say, hot, and she'd just go, well, hot, <laughs> she got the word, right, and, and she didn't know many words, but, 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 you know, she was able to say hot, and, and so we were trying to tell her, don't walk near it, and we were in the kitchen one day, you know, and she was toddling around the house, and all of a sudden we heard this blood-curdling scream from the next room. <laughs> She had walked onto that red-hot grate with her bare foot, and she was screaming. And, of course, it made a grid mark on the bottom of her foot. And we took her to the doctor, and it was, it was okay, but not good. <laughs> but anyway, do you know she would go around the house and point, hot. <laughs> she knew what that word really meant. <laughs> Hot. As a matter of fact, people would come over to visit us. The first thing they come in the front door, she'd point, hot. <laughs> she wanted to make sure they didn't walk on it. She had a burden in her heart, his little heart. She had a burden in her heart for the hotness of that grate. When God gives you his word and his word is in your heart, it gives you a burden. To live such as his word says. To tell people what his word is and will do for them. And it's a burden that's like no other burden in the world. Job, 32nd chapter, says these words. Behold... My belly is like unvented wine, like new wineskins. It's about to burst. When God places his word within you, if it's his word, it'll be like unvented wine, ready to burst out and touch the lives of those around you. Unvented wine. You can't think of anything else. I know this might sound strange, but this word has been on my heart all week, and I've hardly been able to think about anything but the word that was coming to you this moment. Burden of the Lord. Carrying the weight of the word of the Lord. Next, it's precious. 1 Samuel 3, this is early in the life of Samuel. It says these words in the third chapter. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. God's word is precious. It's rare. In other words, in the days of Samuel, the word of the Lord was rare to hear it. It was unusual. It was unique. God's pure, true word, like pure gold, is different than other words. It can even be, by the culture, considered strange or foreign or even scary. When Lot, Abraham's nephew, was in Sodom, to live a righteous life was strange and different and weird to the Sodomites and those of Gomorrah. It was so unique and different that they couldn't even understand what it meant. Do you know Shadrach and his friends in Babylon, as they lived the life of God, it was so unique and different that they wanted to ultimately burn it up. They wanted to burn those lives in a furnace. 
with Abednego and Meshach. Jeremiah carried the word of the Lord in Jerusalem and it was so unique they had to get rid of it and put him down in a pit and lowered him by these huge ropes down into a pit. It was so rare and so different and if you will, so precious that they knew not what to do with it. Now this word... Not just what we're speaking in this church, but wherever God's Word is, in a gray church, what did I call it? In a gray, didn't say black and white, in a gray church, where it's neither black nor white, neither hot nor cold, in a gray church of confusion, His Word shines bright and sharp and different and unique and Precious. We were in southern Ukraine, and I was just speaking the word of God in this church. No one had been in that church. Actually, it was a building. It wasn't really even a church, but no one had spoken God's word there in maybe 100 years. You know, you know, but before the Bolshevik Revolution would be the last time that it was spoken there. So I'm speaking God's word, and to me it's nothing unusual. It's what we hear, you know, so often. But it was so precious and rare and different and unique and unusual to those that heard it, that one man out there had his whole family jump up in the middle of me giving the message and said, Stop! We want this right now. I want this for my whole family. Pray for me and my family now. I want this, what you are saying now. He did not want to wait another five minutes to hear the end of the sermon. He didn't want to wait for an altar call. He didn't want to wait. He wanted it now. It was that alive to him. So then the question comes to you and to me. How precious is God's word to you? Is it the gold, the refined gold of the sanctuary? The gold of the sanctuary is like no other gold in the world. 24, promise. God's word is a promise. It says in Romans 9, 9, for this is a word of promise. Say it with me. For this is a word of promise. One more time. For this is a word of promise. Within God's word, there is promise. There's the promise of eternal life. And I might add the promise of eternal damnation. You know, there's a difference. There really is a heaven and there really is a hell, life, death. But it says in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, it says, all the promises of God in him are yea and in him Amen. Very interesting scripture in Romans. We talk about the promise of God. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. You ready for this? <laughs> There's a concept for you. Every time someone deceives you, or every time someone says they're a friend and then betrays you, or every time that a parent or a child or someone precious and dear to you turns on you and ends up not being true, every time the world lies to you, right? You're listening to this, right? Every time the world gives you a promise and it turns out to not be accurate. I'll tell you what that does. It not so much confirms that they are a liar or a skeptic or deceptive one as it confirms the truth of God. Think of that. So someone lies to you, God you're true. Someone deceives you, God you're accurate. Someone turns on you, God you're faithful. What does this do for us? It turns again and again the negative and the darkness and the evil back around to being good (laughs) because it turns our eyes towards 
the Lord. You know, everything points towards the glory of God. Are you aware of this? Even the damnation of the godless points to his holiness and his righteousness and his glory and his wonder and his might. It's true. His promises are always truth. T-R-U-T-H. His promises are always truth. Always true. Faith. The word of God is faith. <laughs> we still didn't finish reading this this morning from Romans 10 where it says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith. Do you know God's word is a powerful producer? It's a powerful producer. It brings the production of faith. It brings the production of resolve. It brings the production of determination. So God's word is not a moneymaker, right? Although some might think so in some places. God's word is not a faith healer. Ooh, what did he just say? God's word is not a faith healer. It's rather the real deal. It produces righteousness. Doesn't mean people don't get healed. Doesn't mean that people don't be, are not blessed. But the production of God's word is righteousness and the fruit of the spirit. Fruit of the spirit. Capital S. It's humility. You know, when, when God blesses me, you ever been blessed by the Lord? I hope you have. <laughs> okay. If you, yeah, a bunch of us have been willing to say, yeah, God has blessed me one or two times in my life. Maybe one or two thousand times in my life. But God has blessed me. But you know, there's a weird thing that happens, and maybe you can't relate, and that's fine if you can't. Don't worry about it. But sometimes, not always, but occasionally, when, when God blesses me, I'll get hit with this, hmm, ooh, I guess he really wants to bless me. Right? And what do I do? I don't know what you do when that happens, when that slithery pride thing starts coming around like this is coming because of you. I instantly do to that, speak what was on that tombstone right near my father's tombstone, this huge monument, and it had those words on it that I'll never forget. Only God is great. It's over somebody's body that I believe probably that person's going to be raised in the great translation of the saints because they got it. <laughs> Only God is great. The grave waits for us unless the translation is soon to be had. So as God blesses you, don't turn it this way, turn it that way, right? Only God is great. <laughs> Say it with me. Only God is great. Absolutely. Number 26, wisdom. 1 Corinthians 12 says, For to one is given the word. What? The word of wisdom. Through the Spirit. Oh, I could say so much, and I want to say so much about wisdom. But the word of wisdom only comes from the wise one. If you're looking for wisdom to come from any other source, forget it. The word of wisdom only comes from the Holy Spirit. Soon, 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 the church will be translated. Soon, soon, the Spirit will be removed. And we see the world as it really is without God. Now, he'll have his witnesses, the two and the 144,000. You've read the Bible, I hope. But the restrainer that holds back sin will be removed. 
And so with the bride, the restrainer leaves as well for a time, seven years, and the world can then see what man is all about. I think probably one of the greatest searches of my life would be for wisdom. I've searched for it, I've prayed for it, I've fasted for it, I've loved it, I've wanted it, I've missed it a lot, <laughs> a lot, but the word of wisdom. With wisdom can comes all kinds of temptations, all kinds of slithering things, because the evil one does not want you to walk in wisdom. Are you aware of this? He does not want you to possess wisdom. He does not want you to be endowed with wisdom. The word of wisdom is an enemy of Satan and a friend of God. 27, knowledge. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8 says, For to one is given the word of knowledge. All true knowledge starts with God. Say it with me. All true knowledge starts with God. He made the mind. He made the conscience. He made our thoughts. Now, how we put them together is really in our free will up to us. Now, I believe in predestination, but I also believe in free will, and it's a balance. But, oh my... Knowledge without God is something twisted. Has not God said? Right? Is what Lucifer said to Eve. Has not God said? In other words, the, the appeal was around knowledge. What did he really say? What was really going on? What was really behind that? That's what Satan was trying to do to her. Has God said? Putting all those deceptions and all those doubts in the woman. But apart from him, we really know nothing. Knowledge under his word, however. Ooh, knowledge under his word is power. Unique power. 28, reconciliation. The word of God is reconciliation. So many things the word of God is. And one of them is certainly reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19 says, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he is committed to us the word of reconciliation. So you got it. It's yours. God's given it to us. The word of reconciliation, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. He's given to us the word of reconciliation. This means wherever we go, we're meant to be reconcilers as we walk under the word that brings reconciliation. I mean, it's not God's will that anyone would perish, right? No one. It's not his will that anybody would perish. He, he wants the whole world, everybody, to be with him forever. All seven billion people now and all the people that ever lived. He wanted them all to go to heaven. As a matter of fact, he reconciled the world where there was a chance for all the world to come through the gates of heaven. But they had to step through the gate of Christ. We with God are the reconcilers. And we with each other and we with sin. There's a huge word that I'd like to talk to us for just a moment about. And this word is called absolution. Absolution. Now the Catholic Church, and I don't mean to pick on them, but they have really twisted this <laughs> absolution where if you say certain number of Hail Marys, which is very difficult, it's complicated to do a whole Hail Mary, it's a whole deal. But you do a certain number of them, you get reconciled. And the priest decides who gets reconciled and what they have to do to get reconciled with God. 
But God means for us not to walk that way, but to be the absolvers, here we go, the absolvers of a culture that is away from God. This means when someone gets right with the Lord, God means for us to say, you're absolved, you're forgiven. We're the ones that speak it. He's in heaven. He's waiting for us to speak it, to bring reconciliation, to bring absolution to a world that so needs forgiveness, that so needs release, right? I was talking to a guy recently, and I was explaining to him about Christ, and he started to get it, and I said, yes, you're starting to understand what the Bible is talking about. And he was, I said, you're close to salvation. Didn't say you were saved, but I said, you're close. Of course, he wanted to know what more he needed to do. <laughs> but yeah. But when we pray with someone or for someone for salvation, I've had the privilege of leading thousands to the Lord. Thousands. And that moment when I can look in their eyes and say, in Christ's name, because of your stance and faith right now, you are forgiven. You are absolved. I mean, to see the release coming across people's face. It's in South Africa, and this man came up to me, held me on the arm, and said, I've got AIDS. He was rubbing my arm. He says, Pastor, would you pray for me? And I prayed for him. I knew he was going to die. But he looked in my eyes and he said, you've healed my heart. Now that wasn't me doing the healing. That was God's word doing the healing. More important the healing of the heart than the healing of the body. More important the peace of the mind and soul than a place of solitude. Last one is washing. Ephesians 5 verse 26 says that he might sanctify her. This is, of course, to the her is talking about the bride of Christ. That he might sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of water with the word. The Word actually cleanses us, actually washes us, actually makes us whole, makes us acceptable to a holy God. The Word Washer. What did you say call that? The Word Washer. <laughs> the Word Washer, it actually does some things. The Word Washer cleanses us from the doubt of God's will. What's God's will? Right? What, what is his will? Oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And his word will wash you from the doubt. It will wash you from the specters of the past. Specters, I'm talking about ghosts, phantoms, you know, thoughts. I have many specters from my past. Hurts, pains, betrayals. And sometimes in the night hours, they will haunt me. I'll think on them, not wanting to. They start coming to me. And I find myself sitting up in bed and thinking, God, may your word cover me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me to green pastures. He makes me lie down beside still waters. And I can feel my heart resting. 
Some of you might know what I'm talking about. I can feel my heart letting go and going, ah, Lord, you're good. All those specters, all those thoughts that are not coming from you are now under your word and under your blood. His word washes us from the uncertainty of life. It washes us from the dismay of family. These are interesting phrases. <laughs> the dismay of family. Why did my father do that? Why did that happen with my mom? Why did that happen with my children? And I think one of the main things his word washes us of is trepidation of the future. What's tomorrow? What's this afternoon? We don't know. But we know that his word will wash us and his word will keep us. And I'll close with this phrase. Again, you go, that's a strange phrase. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll get it. God's word will make us godlike. It'll make us sons and daughters of divinity. I would say run to his word. Let his word wash you. Let it bring you absolution and reconciliation and peace. Let it bring you the great burden of God so that others would know the way, the truth, and the life. And someday you and I will be with the word forever.